Hey, this is John Arch, formerly of Fate's Warning and currently with Arch Matteo, and you're listening to Sonic Perspective. Keep it mental, my friend. That was awesome. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome to part two of my talk with John Arch. In case you missed it, John was awesome enough to offer a second round after our first hour was up. So, without further ado, here's the rest of our talk. I'm going to be shooting another video for the album um, tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday. And oh, it's awesome. Been, yeah, cool. Yeah, we're doing, um, we're doing one for Tethered, and it's... Uh, yeah. um, you know, you just think you never, you never think you're ready. I'm looking for shit to wear. I'm trying to get my get my stuff together the last minute. So there's going to be some traveling and stuff. So whatever, that's it's all good. So it's just uh, you know preparing for that. Awesome. Who's so uh, who's going to be directing the video? This is David Brodsky again. We've had such good luck with him, um, you know, in the past, uh-huh. especially with, uh, the Straight and Arrow. So uh, awesome. David and uh, his uh, girl Allie. Um, we would be working with them again. So I'm more looking forward to it. Okay, cool. Yeah, that last video looked fantastic. Thank you. That was, uh, yeah, that was basically flying by the seat of our pants. Jim really wasn't available for that video. Um, and uh, uh, we basically, my wife and I, I don't know if I, if I told you this already or no. Uh, no, not yet. Oh, okay. So, yeah, my wife and I uh, got my truck and I towed the motorcycle behind it. We drove down from Connecticut down to the Poconos. Um, and we were hoping for good weather because, mm-hmm. of course, riding the motorcycle. So, uh, unfortunately, I wish we had, you know, weather like Texas, but not really. So, it was <laughs> the second the second day was 27 degrees out, and I'm doing like 50 miles an hour. Yeah, oh, no. on the motorcycle. Uh, so, yeah, the wind chill factor was like it was it was near zero on my face. So, oh no! Um, so there was two days of that, but you know what we do for rock and roll, right? Yeah, no kidding. I heard that you guys had also filmed a video while Fates was touring with Queensrÿche a couple weeks ago. It was actually uh, probably longer than that, maybe maybe a month ago okay. at this point. I, I think, you know, again, don't quote me, but right. that was a straight and narrow. Um, I, we, it was an opportunity for us um, to do the straight and narrow. Um, Metal Blade was um, actually asking us to do uh, a video for Wanderlust, but, um, it, which would have been fine. But in my opinion, I thought that uh, you know, straight and narrow uh, would make a a good video as well mm-hmm. um and i kind of i kind of like the energy of that song for a video so um the opportunity came about where um you know fate's warning is on tour so that means that um of course jim and bobby you know two of the players on that song were available mm-hmm. and also um the sellersville theater which is located in pennsylvania was also available for us to do the live narrative for the um for the video, so mm-hmm. that's what I said. They flew in. Um, they flew in Steve D. Giorgio, and um, okay. I drove drove down, and we had this mass convergence, and we did the uh, the video part of it. And then um, uh, the following weekend, I drove you know back down to Pennsylvania with a bike to do that act that footage for the narrative. Twenty seven with the windshield, and also like okay, so that happened about a month ago. The video has been out for about what two weeks. That's a really quick turnaround. You know what? It, it, that's the way it, it, everything goes in this business. I, everything is like a rush. I don't know why it ends up being like that, but that, um, yeah, it was very quick. Um, we really didn't have much time to actually put together a narrative. So, uh-huh. um, I had I had some ideas, and I gave David Brosky, you know, some thoughts, you know, about the roadside crosses and the motorcycle and all that stuff, and he took them from there and um, really kind of, you know, embellished on it a little bit, especially with the uh, flying following me with a drone and having GoPros mounted mm-hmm. all over the bike. It was it was really cool. Yeah. I, I broke, broke my balls off, but you know what? It was worth it in the long run because it was um um we shot that and so we had the live narrative that was like one day and then the motorcycle footage and all that stuff was another two days. So three days we put that together. So crazy. crazy wow. Shit. 
three days of wind chill. Wow. Yeah, well, the two, it was two days of wind chill. Um, yeah, it was 27. And at 60 Jeez. miles an hour, I was doing 60, 65 coming around some of those bends. Jeez. And it was, it was cold. My yeah. Body stayed warm. I was dressed really warm, so my body stayed really warm. Uh-huh. But it was just because I had no helmet on and, and just, you know, I had earplugs in and stuff. But still, mm-hmm. that's a that's that's a cold day. That's a cold day. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. It rarely gets that cold down where I live. I mean, like, I, I think we've seen 27 degrees about five times in the past few years. It does not happen oh. often. Uh, I have to move to a different climate. I've been to Texas. I actually went to uh, boot camp at uh, Lackland Air Force Base. So I was in the uh, Air Force. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah, so I know I know how warm it can get there, you know, marching on that black top. Mm-hmm. And it's 100 103 degrees, but here in New England, we just get we get hammered. And to be honest with you, I am so tired of it. I really enjoy, you know, it's beautiful scenery, and I still, you know, I ski and I mountain bike. Even in the weather, I put some snow tires on, um, and I really enjoy it. But you know what? I, I think I'm ready for a warmer climate. Mm-hmm. So as soon as things iron out here, you know, with parents and all that stuff, I am packing my. Well, we're packing our bags and. Heading south somewhere, I'm not sure. Maybe Utah, I have no idea. Yeah, Utah gets cold too. <laughs> yeah, 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 not as cold as here, but yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so yeah, so a really good friend of mine who's also really, really metal uh, is stationed at Lackland right now. So I'm going to let her know that you were there, and she's probably going to flip out. I was there, yes, and it was a very memorable experience. Uh-huh. And it was, you know, and it was probably, it was back in the day, you know, where I went to Catholic schools and we got nailed. We got hit all the time by uh-huh. nuns. And it's like, who, who can't? Who, who can't? I, I know I have PTSD because of it. Oh, no. So, um, no, I'm, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, the Air Force, I mean, as far as basic training, it was a little bit different back then, too, because they were they were allowed to, you know, kind of get pushy and physical with you a little bit. But mm-hmm. I don't think it's like that anymore. As far as I know, I don't think they can do that. But um, yeah. Yeah, you know what? It was all in all. I think it's a, it was a good experience, kind of like uh, I think maybe everybody should spend some time at boot camp and learn that, uh, you know, learn some lifelong lessons. And uh, that was cool. I did my four years and got mm-hmm. out, and that was that. Oh, cool. Uh, well, I, moved to he- I moved to heavy metal after that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what year were you in boot camp here? Oh, God. Um, I grad- I think it was... God, well, I'm dating myself, but it was like 78 or, yeah, 78 or 9. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. then I went to uh, Chinook Air Force Base in Illinois for, you know, school and training and stuff, and then back up here to Bradley in Connecticut. So. Oh, that's interesting, because like I, I just realized that every singer that's ever been in Fate's Warning has had roots in San Antonio in some way or the other. Wow, yeah. That's crazy. That's yeah. Yeah, and, it was, and then, of course, we, we played... You know, when I was with the band, we played Texas, and it was awesome. Played Sunken Gardens. And, oh, yeah, and that, awesome. I live right by the Sunken Gardens. I love that place. That was great. It was great. It was a great show. We played there with Saxon and Killer Dwarfs. Oh, man. And, um, back in the day, it was cool. And I uh, played dates in uh, San Antonio and Austin. So, But the thing of it is, it's, it's like just such a mu- musical uh, mecca. Yeah. Um, you know, it, at least it was, and I hear that it still is. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, to a lesser degree than it was back in the day, but uh, but there's still lots of metal in here in Austin. Yeah, very very cool place. I enjoyed my time there for sure. Cool. So uh, so when we were talking yesterday, and when we had to we had to abruptly end our conversation. <laughs> um, Apolo- apologies. No, 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 no. It's all good. It's all good. I'm I'm so grateful that you like that that you're willing to talk to me again. I mean, that's really awesome of you, and I'm very grateful for that. Sure. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. So, like, so we were talking about we were talking about your lyrics and and your command of the English language and uh, and I'm kind of wondering like who inspired you to start writing in the first place. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. What inspired me to write? Um, I think um, you know, and this might this might even go back to. to Catholic schools too, because we did a lot of biblical, you know, reading, and it was all about, uh, you know, studying. And, and I was always interested in history. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, when I, you know, when I when I and I was always, uh, you know, always loved music, and I was always enamored by, you know, uh, well written, uh, written, um, 
lyrics with content in them, you know, mm-hmm. uh, not so much, not so much the glam band era, but yeah. you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe Maiden, of course, I was a big fan of Maiden. Of course. That was, that was insp- inspirational. You know, Number of the Beasts is one of my favorite albums of all time. It was so super inspiring, and I still love that album uh, to this day. It was a landmark album for me. But, um, and so then, you know what, when I took on the role of, um, you know, being a lead singer, putting the guitar down, and then, of course, you know, turning to writing original music, um, you know, I, I just assumed the role. I guess mm-hmm. I always uh, thought that that's the way it should be mm-hmm. um, as far as writing my own melody lines and writing my own lyrics. It just seemed to be fitting because, uh, you know, being the one singing it, um, everything, you know, as far as a syncopation and the wording it's all tied in together so it, it I, I i would imagine singing what somebody else had written would probably be weird for me but um mm-hmm. it's just, and i think it just happened it was part of a, a developmental uh, a phase and um i don't know all part of the progressive uh, metal i guess and in, in the way that um at the time you know jim and vic and then jim and frank and you know they were writing the guitar parts and stuff and the way the music and all those movements that were happening mm-hmm. it just didn't seem like anything else would fit you know what else do you write to something mm-hmm. with all those guitar harmonies and those you know diminished and and eerie sounding harmonies and chords mm-hmm. and all those um, weird rhythms yeah yeah everything switched you know we go from six to four to nine and like it's just the way the music was written, and um, mm-hmm. you know, if you really sh- if you really think about it, you know, it, you know, singing delicate lyrics, uh, you know, in four or four just would not mesh with that, and it's uh, <laughs> it, it's just it's it's something that I think I had to do. So I kind of challenged myself. Okay, what especially like with Awaken a Guardian uh, and Spectre, you know, what uh, what kind of uh, what would fit this, you know? And when we came up with the, you know, I think uh, the calling. You know, we came across "Space Warning Is Heard" part of the uh, lyrics, and that's where we came up with the well, "Why We Use Space Warning for uh, for a band name." And uh, so then it just seemed like at that period of time, um, everything was kind of written around the term "Space Warning." You know, it was kind of mysterious and um, and mythological, um, and, and it fit the music. Mm-hmm. And what was what was nice about that, I think it all meshed in. And it ended up being kind of a musical journey and a lyrical journey, uh, kind of woven together, which made it kind of complex. But I thought it was a really cool thing because um, it was a musical journey that kind of it kind of takes it takes a listener, you know, off their day to day reality and kind of off this planet for a while, and um, it kind of forces you to you know close your eyes and use your your creative mind. And I I thought that was like so opposite of, the, of uh, you know, uh, the glam bands and then what came after totally. that, Nirvana, Nirvana and all that stuff. It was it was totally kind of stood on its own as being different. Um, so I think our humble beginnings uh, was, was probably a very productive, uh, you know, time for us. And, um, you know, not to get away from your, your question, <laughs> but I think the, the lyrics, I mean, that, that's basically the story. I kind of uh, wrote what I thought was fitting to the music and then, you know, um, and then as, uh, you know, other things that I have done, like, um, you know, from Twist of Faith to Sympathetic Resonance and mm-hmm. now Winter Ethereal, um, you know, I'm not saying, uh, you know, the Dungeon and Dragons theme is, is uh, you know, passe at this point. Um, I'm sure there's a place for it, but um, it seemed that I kind of wanted more to um, stay with the emotionally driven lyrics that kind of, <laughs> Um, more relate to uh, real life experiences and stuff that I can I can draw from. Yeah. Um, so it kind of was kind of a new chapter and uh, turning the page, but still having the music being complex, but still also having the, the lyrics and the uh, melody lines twisting and turning in different directions over the guitar parts, etc., to make it um, still interesting. So I kind of I really like keeping that element of it, but you know exploring. Um, 
you know, a different side of lyric writing. Yeah, that's you, you just touched on a number of topics that I wanted to bring up. And like one of them was like, so so your your melodies, you mentioned that just a moment ago. Um, like a big part of that, like when I hear you sing, a big part of your melodies to me is your sense of phrasing. And like as weird and cool as as your uh, as your sense of phrasing uh, was in the original, you know, the first Three Fates Warning albums, it seems so vastly improved. Like, it's even better on uh, on Winter Ethereal. And, like, in some of the interlude melodies, for example, like, what we talked about Vermilion Moon, uh, Vermilion Moons, and, like, that interlude, those melodies, uh, like, in that middle, slower part of the song, just blow yeah, yeah, my yeah. mind. They blow my mind. Oh, wow. Well, see, that's what's so cool about it, because, you know, I, I am kind of, like, following my you know, uh, I don't know, my intuition. And, of course, I, I like to challenge myself, too. So um, I'll be going through, uh, the, you know, as I'm listening to the music, I, my mind will be all over the place, uh, kind of rapidly going through, uh, not not scales, but kind of like almost like Dorian modes, whatever mm -hmm. would fit, but whatever would fit melodies, but also... You know, it would have to fit, but also be challenging and being on the cusp of a, you know, uh, uh, of challenging uh, the the root chords and the root notes. Right. Um, so yeah, so there's a constantly that kind of battle going on, and and you know, sometimes I could, you know, even for like one verse, I could go over probably hundreds of of um, uh, possibilities, mm -hmm. and um, eventually, um, and. I'll end up somewhere where maybe I'll do, again, like what I do with Gemma, I'll do something that I originally had, but a hybrid of it uh, through experimentation, and I'll come up with something that I'm really happy with because it, it kind of, you know, tickles the imagination a little bit, um, <laughs> and it and it kind of um, veers away from like a kind of a mundane or a um, you know a melody line that might first come to somebody, you know, what maybe what somebody else would sing over it. Um, but it's interesting that you say that because, you know, to me it almost seems natural, but it's very interesting when I hear feedback to how someone else interprets what I'm doing mm -hmm. because I, you never know. Um, our brains are the, they're the same, you know, um, you know, maybe physically, but how they work are in, in p different people is so vastly different. Just mm -hmm. like somebody may really love country western or really love rap or you know blues or any other genre of music but you know a, a metalhead is like you know a, you know i don't know it's, it's almost like we catch that bug and it's with us for life yeah pretty um, much but it's just yeah that's how our brains work uh, my wife her, is like one of my biggest fans and when she puts the headphones on and she listens to that she just keeps on you know looking at me and calling me a jerk you know in a good way <laughs> <laughs> And I think what that relates to is I'm always doubting myself and doubting myself, and I'm making disparaging comments about myself. That's what I. That's kind of what I do to motivate myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's, it's really you know. Self hey, hey man, if that's and what works, because you, you end up delivering the goods, and if that's how you motivate yourself, awesome, keep doing that. Don't stop. <laughs> that is kind of how my inner workings work. It's it's a weird uh, weird devices, but it seems to work for me. But yeah, but she'll look at me and like you know. Because I'll say, you know, my, my just my voice is not there, and I'm not happy with this. And then she'll, you know, she'll just say, you know, you you just don't even know what you're talking about. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let me move on. So I guess my point being, I appreciate what you said. Um, and, and it's cool how people will hear things differently than than maybe the way I hear them, or sometimes they get it and they hear it the same way. So mm -hmm. well, you know, like minds think alike. I also got to give you mad props for uh, for the way that you incorporate melisma into your work. Uh, like you've always, you know, every time that you've done that, it's managed to add this bizarre tension that always serves the song for the better. I think Prelude to Ruin is a great example of that, where you're just kind of like, there's this melody and then you just like take it off to this weird place in the same breath. And yeah, yeah and, and like that's that's not something that, that I've been able to find in a whole lot of uh, in a whole lot of rock or metal singers before you, so I'm kind of wondering where that came from. Um, I think um, most of that I probably can attribute to being spontaneous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
sometimes we take chances and, you know, God, okay, that sounds awful. Forget that, you know, because, you know, we think what it might sound like in your head. But I think it's the stuff that I've done subconsciously, like not even thinking about um, and just let it fly. And it's like, you know, wow, where the hell did that come from? You know, and, and that, most of the stuff, that's where that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not something that is planned like I'm writing out on, on key, you know, uh, keyboards, which I do. Sometimes on melody, melody lines, I, I got a, a keyboards in front of me, mm-hmm. and I experiment with melody lines that way sometimes. But I think what you're talking about is um, it, it's more of the spontaneous stuff. And where it comes from, I don't know. Um, you know, I've often thought that um, we as people, uh, we are genetically predisposed to a lot of things that I don't think we're even aware of. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of the, um, I think what you call melisma and and the, um, the fluctuation of my voice and quick changes and mm-hmm. up and down, that kind of thing, um, I don't know why I get this feeling uh, that it's part of my um, Celtic roots um, mm. or Celtic roots, whatever, however you want to pronounce it, mm-hmm. um, you know, being, uh, you know, the majority of me Irish um, as far as, you know, a singular um, descendant. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I um, when I listen to like Steve Morse, or you know, listen to uh, Celtic music, I really it, it hits me. I really feel like I've been there before. Hmm. Um, and so I think that's par- partially, you know, why when I do something subconsciously, um, and it, 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 it sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But the times that it does work out, you know, I may attribute because I'm not I'm not musically trained, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> or classically trained. No, I took vocal lessons and it was more about the um, anatomy of the voice where uh, working with the larynx and the musculature uh, surrounding the larynx and being familiar with the anatomy and exercises, etc., using your vibrato and um, things like that, but not so much um, like operatic kind of cha- uh, um, um, training. Mm-hmm. But in my, in my family, my father uh, was a vocalist uh, my mother played piano. My sister was classically trained as operatic a singer, uh, classical style music. And my other sister um, uh, graduated Hart School of Music uh, as a concert pianist. And my brother, uh, Jimmy, also, um, he can read mu- music, uh, but he also he plays a lot by ear. He plays keyboards. He actually played on Epitaph. He played oh. on, um, uh, on uh, Spectre Within. Huh. You know, the ending parts, you, you'll hear the car, the keyboards. That was my brother Jimmy playing. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so a little tidbit. Um, so, you know what? There's, there's like this. Um, I only have one sister that's tone deaf and can't sing away on the <laughs> as far as I know. But I think everybody else was kind of musical in my family. So um, that's where I kind of maybe go back to, you know, where does that come from? And I think it's, uh, you know, and I'm not saying me in particular. I think we all, mm. depending on our you know, uh, where we're descended from, and it's, if we have, we all have European roots, and even uh, Native American Indians, um, you know, have their style of, of music and mm-hmm. chanting, um, you know, so I don't know, I think uh, it's a possibility that that stuff is, uh, you know, genetically encoded in us, maybe. Huh. Cool. And I could be full. I could be full of shit too. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm just. I'm, I'm just guessing. You know? It's literally in your blood, though. That's not a. That, that that's that's a fantastic outlook that I love. <laughs> you know, and, and it very well could be, and that's the only expl- explanation I have it, have for it because I, I I am familiar with you know reading music, but I don't mm-hmm. sight read very very well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I get the concept of you know uh, written music, but um, so everything that I've uh, ever done has been by ear and by feel emotionally. Mm-hmm. So so instead of having it written out for me, I just kind of go more towards feel and what feels right. Very rock and roll. You uh, you mentioned the old glam bands not once but at least twice. So I was wondering if you could confirm something for me. Uh, I heard through the grapevine that Valley of the Dolls was about the glam scene. Oh, there's no doubt about it. That that was a direct, very. That's probably like I don't know. It's probably one of my most direct lyrics. You know, they're not my best lyrics, but um, again, again, I, I kind of like took the song with Jim and 
you know, whoever the writers were at that point as far as the, the music composition was concerned. But I took it, I listened to it, and the way it moved, and uh, I don't know, man, I think I was probably reading a Kerrang! magazine or, you know, whatever was out at that point in time, you know, back in the early 80s. And it's just like, and, and, um, you know, seeing the glam bands, and I don't know why. I just went in that direction and <laughs> kind of un unorthodox, and it certainly was definitely a step away from the songs on, or the rest of the songs on the album. But that, that is for sure a very a blatant, um, <laughs> a very blatant dig at, um, at that. Um, and I'm not, you know, listen, you know, I, I, I am not the type of person to like take away anything from anybody. You know, I believe uh, to each his own. You, if you do what you do, as long as you're not hurting anybody, and whatever type of music you like, I, I have all due respect, and whatever faith you have, all due respect. So I'm not telling anybody what to listen to. It's just that at that point in time, it was such a contrast to what we were doing. Um, and, you know, I don't know. It's just my personal opinion, you know, as far as the way that the guys dressed up with the makeup and, and all the, you know, to me, that was like, what? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> What is, what's going on here, man? What is what is the root of this? Um, and I'm not talking about the music. I'm talking about just the actual mm -hmm. um, the glamour or the uh, uh, what, what, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. Yeah, the, the image. The image, exactly. Thank you. I'm such a simple word. And I, I couldn't. Hear. But yeah, <laughs> the image that that went along with um, that. I mm -hmm. mean, the girls loved it. You know, their inner, inner lesbian came flying out, and you know, it was just that that I was kind of, um, that was more of the subject matter. It wasn't actually the, the music, which, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, there was some stuff that came out that, that was fine. I mean, there's some sort of Motley Crue stuff that I liked, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of the, the, the whole era, but it was basically a kind of a poke at the imagery, mm -hmm. um, rather than, than the music. Cause some people probably get offended, but you know, mm -hmm. it's, but like, you know, we were young. yeah, a playful jab more than a scathing indictment, I suppose. Right. Oh, absolutely. It was all in jest and fun, you okay. know. So you also mentioned Iron Maiden a moment ago. Uh, how did it feel when several years, years later Iron Maiden put out a song called Fate's Warning? Yeah, you know, I wasn't even aware of that. Really? <laughs> so, so strange. Yeah, I, I was not even aware of that. Um, you know, I followed Iron Maiden up to, you know, like Power Slave, and, um, you know, I've heard Bruce Dickinson's solo albums, and... Um, you know, at some point in time, I didn't follow them, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, religiously, religiously got, like I did. I'm totally unfamiliar with the Blaze era. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I've, I've seen them since then. Um, uh, New, uh, was it, uh, New Frontiers, was that? Final uh, Frontier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I saw, them, I saw them supporting that album over up in over in Europe. I saw them do two shows in a row at this Enormo Dome and sell out both shows. Nice. Oh, just, just incredible, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I wasn't even familiar, familiar okay. with that until so, somebody had mentioned it, and I'm like, you know, I, 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 it was a brief thought, like, I don't know if, you know, they ever even heard of Fate's Warning or not. <laughs> I mean, odds are they, they probably have, uh, you know, at some point, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, but somebody actually told me um, that uh, they're a, a fan of um, you know, early Fates Warning, and they actually met, most of my friends have met Bruce Dickinson, and I hate them all. Because, I, you know, I haven't <laughs> I haven't met him yet, it's like and I told Brian Slagle, it's like dude, you gotta hook me up with these days I gotta, I have to meet Bruce before I die, you know Hey John, so, yeah, I've met Bruce Dickinson Oh, I hate you too, okay see? <laughs> no, twice, I mean, you know, twice <laughs> I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm green with envy that's why, um <laughs> You know, so but one of my friends told me that um, you know, he, that he had met Bruce Dickinson and actually got into a discussion with him and and brought my name up um, in Fate's Warning and that Bruce was actually a fan. Really? Of of uh, yeah, my vocals and and saying uh, he made uh, you know very positive uh, comments. So what what I was told that um, I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, that's like a huge for me. That's a huge thing. Yeah. Because you know, I just think. I think Bruce Dickinson as not, you know, as well as his, his music, but the, the guy's a genius. He's a mm -hmm. marketing genius. Um, he's, um, you know, he's, uh, he's like uh, um, uh, one of a kind. Oh, a renaissance uh, man. <laughs> 
he's just he's, he's, he's a, you know, who does not want to be Bruce? You know, flying, you know, a jet airliner, you know, pilot's license, and uh, writing books. Just such an accomplished, driven human being. I wish I had that type of energy, conviction, and courage, and whatever else he's got in that uh, that genetic soup of his that he's been blessed with. Um, you know, just unbelievable. So, yeah, yeah. But it's pretty cool, uh, you know. Hopefully, uh, that, that would be really cool if they actually have, um, you know. I don't. Again, I don't know if they had anything to do with us. Probably not. But um, I do. I do know that uh, you know a friend of mine did tell me firsthand that he knew of the band and, and, and has heard me before. So wow, to me that's like you know, like it's complete. Dude, cool. he, even the possibility that Bruce freaking Dickinson might be a fan of John Arch—that's just nuts. That is nuts. It's, yeah, it's, it's probably too good to be true, but it's um, <laughs> it, 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 it's re it's really cool. It's just it's cool because I've I've obviously he's like uh, one of my biggest inspirations. Yeah. Um, and I and I just think one hell of a, you know, uh, an accomplished guy. You know. You know, very, some, very bright, very intelligent guy. Absolutely. Yeah. He's a, he's an un, an incredible human being that I admire a great deal. So uh, you'll meet him one day. <laughs> you'll find out firsthand. I hope so. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. And I, I won't go all fanboy on him, but I will, you know, for sure. You know, that'd be great uh, just to get a chance to be in the same room with him. We almost, we were supposed to be able to meet them actually, actually at those two shows, um, you know, when we went with Brian Slagle uh -huh. uh, back. Uh, it was, um, I think it was for, yes, yeah, for Sympathetic Resonance when we went over to, they sent us over to London mm -hmm. to do some press with Metal Blade. So we had those opportunities, but it just didn't, didn't happen. So uh -huh. that's, it. that's a shame. So we're like we've spent a lot of time talking about Vermilion Moons, and while we were talking about that song, it, it dawned on me that lunar imagery was really, really prominent on the first three page warning albums. Wow! Yeah, you know what? I never made that connection. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I did. Well, you know, I, you know, as far as the, you talk about the album cover for like, uh, you know, Night on Brocken, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was kind of like just the, um, I guess the first album cover, you know, that was. Uh, you know, it was just, um, you know, it was it was probably typical of album covers, you know, that day of, of bands that are, you know, on independent labels. It was quite typical, you know, mm -hmm. uh, albums that were not very tasteful or but whatever. But, you know, we weren't really a big fan of the first, you know, um, we were trying to tell a story and, you know, uh, the gentleman that did the artistry on it was, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, they, they replaced it with the moon, the moon shot. Yeah. yeah so, and, um. And yeah, you know, I, I never even thought of that, but yeah, there probably are a, a, a few, you know, out of this world, you know, um, connections there that that fit the lyrics, and and uh, it seems like I just don't want to be on this planet. I want to be on another <laughs> planet elsewhere, out in some other far galaxy, far beyond. You know, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know why, but it's um, they make for good, you know, inspiring lyrics. It's, it's what, whatever makes you wonder. Whatever makes you uh, spawn your imagination, whatever makes you think, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and to be honest, reality is really not that interesting. Okay, there is a line in the song "Wanderlust" that says, "Beware of those who see in black and white." And I and I get the feeling that there's a deeper story there that I presently don't have access to because I can't see the lyrics. I would like to know more about the song "Wanderlust." Yeah, you know, that's kind of almost a, cl it's a closing phrase for the song, but Wanderlust, um, you know, um, there's actually, uh, um, the song itself was inspired actually by a friend of mine um, who is uh, Native American mm -hmm. and, um, you know, very, and you know how I feel about, uh, you know, Native Americans, I really um, feel strongly about, you know, their, their beliefs with nature and the connection with nature and, um, you know, Actually, everything that is around around um, them, they uh, are gods, and they and they pay homage and respect to them. So, anyway, uh, my my friend, um, and she's a woman. She's a, a, an Indian girl, and um, the way she is and the way she carries herself, she's very very reserved, and she doesn't speak much, and um, until she gets to know you. Uh, but she she um, holds you know her heritage very near and dear. She was actually the, kind of the the inspiration uh, for the direction that the song went in. Okay. And, uh, and so to refer to, um, uh, beware of those who see in black and white. What I'm referring to 
is um, our imagination and our creativity and in in free spiritedness in living your life that way. And, um, you know, un unfortunately, in some aspects, we're surrounded by those who see in black and white. And they see us as numbers, and they see us as just pawns. And in our society, the way it has changed, um, you know, with the industrialized, uh, you know, revolution. Um, and so that's what I mean by beware of those who see in black and white, you know, money-hungry mm -hmm. people and people who uh, live for personal gain only. And they have no um, creativity and they have no vision. Okay. Or, you no, know, uh, very, very little empathy. That's kind of what I'm, I'm pointing at. Okay. Okay, that sounds so much more uh, like uh, rooted in in reality than than the fantasy stuff that that uh, that I grew up hearing you do, you know, with those early Fates Warning albums. So, like, I'm kind of I'm kind of wondering, like, since you're since you're dealing lyrically with uh, you know with things that like part of day to day life for mo uh, for most people, I'm wondering, like, where have you taken your lyrics on uh, on this new album uh, that kind of challenged you or made you uncomfortable like 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 where did you challenge yourself yeah. most in, in in writing lyrics i have to say like uh, one particular song in, in in particular um let me back up but I, okay. I would say that everything that i've ever done um there are things based in reality but mm -hmm. they're worded they're worded metaphorically okay not. Okay. And they're open they're open to interpretation a lot, mm -hmm. which I think is great because um again, like I said, our minds are uh very different. They look the same on the outside but different on the inside. And uh I think something that's left for interpretation sometimes is mm -hmm. is great because people see it different and I always get a charge out of hearing what um what uh, the fans and the listener has gotten out of the lyrics. Um so back to what challenged me most on this album, mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not, because the lyrics, I can't say that they're not intricate. I mean, you know, maybe they are on a certain level, but I think they're they're more open and honest than on any other song. And I'm speaking of uh, Kindred Spirits, okay. which is the last song on the album. You know, I, don't know, I think it's over 12 minutes long. Yeah. Um, the reason that song challenged me was because like I said earlier, with Jim, um, I he writes musical compositions, and then I listen to them over and over again. And he de he definitely has what he thinks will be good for you know uh, choruses and for like a bridge and for um, verses, etc. So it's it's just got the foundation of what he has designed in his mind. And then sometimes we start working on them, and sometimes we work together, and things change because as a vocalist, I need to make breathing room. I need to um, sometimes as I write, I need to change things and I need to um, steer things in a different direction uh, depending on, on how it comes out. Mm -hmm. But with Kindred, with kindred Spirits, um, the issue, it wasn't an issue, but my, tra my thought was basically I closed my eyes and listened to the song hundreds of times with the headphones on, like mm -hmm. deep into the morning sometimes I got to get up for work and I haven't slept and I, I got the song going on in my head. But so it's it's how the music is going to kind of root me um, or, or turn me um, emotionally and intellectually, um, but mostly emotionally at first. So it's how I interpret what Jim is trying to convey, writing the music. I want to try to complement what Jim is writing. I don't want to try to overshadow it, and I don't want to try to think some, some something over that doesn't fit or doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. Right. So it's kind of you know I, you have guidelines that you really need to um um peri perimeters that I need to stay i you know aware of. But you know it's funny how I came up with um you know animals there more than that to me. I kind of came to that section. And the way the syncopation of the song came, it's that those words popped into my head. But so there's multiple things going on at the same time. The way the song is written, it's very emotional. Uh, there are many movements in the song, and so at some point, um, I I envisioned um, like. Uh, uh, you know, abuse animals and animals that are not cared for, and you know, real life um, situation. And I'm an animal lover, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know, that's a subject that's really 
hasn't been written about too often that I know of. Um, hmm. And it again, it just seemed to fit. So I think my struggle was, and as I moved on with the song, you know, it actually, it even cemented more and more as I went along because everything was falling into place. The, the, the subject matter, and, and I, I was trying to express um, myself, and I was trying to express the relationship between our animals, our friends, um, and the deep connectedness between um, the two. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, being on social media, you know, we are inundated with, um, with our friends and what they're going through when they lose their sometimes best friend, you know, yeah. man's best friend. And what a powerfully emotional thing it is. And I know firsthand because I've always, of course, I've, I've had German Shepherds all my life. And, you know, when it came time, you know what I'm talking about? When it came time where we know um, if they didn't die naturally, but they were in so much pain and, you know, it was the end of their life, how, what, how, how, I can't, you know, you can't even describe it. It's like an out of body experience that you feel, you know, when we lose our friends and family and humans, um, we feel something very similar. And then with animals, for some reason, it's like we feel like we are indebted to them uh, because they have given us sometimes what humans cannot give us. Yeah. And then, we'll, and then when we lose them, we feel horribly responsible for it. And we see the innocence in their eyes. And we want to save them, and we want to do everything that we can to do so, but it's out of our hands. So, you know, there are many twists and turns in the song, and it's a journey, and it's not all about sad either. It, it's basically a, it's a whole story uh, line based on reality and what we go through. And it's meant to be joyful as well, and, and, and feeling, um, you know, during the choruses, and when you feel that, that elevated music and it starts to build and it builds even more, it's supposed to be kind of a euphoric feeling and a celebration of, you know, what our animals have done for us and how we should feel empathy for them. We should have their gift and how we should treat them as such and treat them with respect and how anybody can abuse animals, um, you know, that we have bred and raised as, you know, companions for us you know, um, is beyond me. And um, I have no sympathy for people that treat animals, with, that abuse animals, with, yeah. you know, uh, abusively. So, you know, I, I know that's a long thing, but so my biggest struggle was lyrics for this because mm -hmm. I thought maybe while I was writing that it may be a subject matter that wasn't fit or maybe it was kind of cliche or maybe it was, uh, maybe it wasn't metal enough. But at some point in the song, I followed my instinct and I said, you know what? At some point you have to say, okay, I'm taking a chance. And it's not that I didn't care what anybody thought, but I thought that um, I'm going to, I'm going to go with my instinct and I'm going to mm -hmm. follow what I'm doing. And, that, and, um, and I'm glad I did because it, it, it ended up being one of my favorite songs on the album. I am, I am really, really glad that you've offered all that insight. Uh, I've got, uh, I, I have uh, taken in two stray dogs. Uh, I've had them for, about five years and about eight years, and uh, and they drive me nuts. <laughs> I know all about that. I <laughs> but but <laughs> I do not look forward to the day that they shuffle off. Like I I I'm not ready for that. You know I, I love these I love these furry critters too much. I, I you know I hear you because you know we did, we've done the same with feral cats. We've spent thousands of dollars in adoptions by. Uh, fixing a neighborhood uh, cat problem that we have because we uh -huh. have one irresponsible owner mm. that let a female cat go and all the tomcats are down here. So we had generations of like kittens and cats, but oh, we, no. ended up cat we ended up trapping them all and having them adopted, having them fixed. We paid for it all. So, you know, it, it's like we do what we feel we, we in our hearts, what we need to do. But I'm glad that you said that because that's exactly what I'm talking about. You save these animals. And they will, they are indebted to you, and, and you know that you feel that. Yeah. And they have, wo they have woven themselves into the fabric of your heart. Yep. And I don't know how they get in there the way they do, because sometimes, like, you, you just think, oh, my God, they drive you nuts. But you know what? You have to show patience, and, and you, it, they give far more than they take. So, yeah. So, yeah. And one of them has taken my hearing, and the other one has taken my once beautiful hardwood floors. And I know, I know. and and I wouldn't change it. <laughs> I really wouldn't. 
I know. It's, sometimes it's really frustrating, and, and we kind of give them a little scolding. But and then the, you know what I'm saying. And then you feel bad for them, and they forgive you immediately. Mm-hmm. So yep. It's, it's it's such it's so different. You know, sometimes it's in in, in a good way. Um, you, you have human relationships, and then you have uh, relationships with animals that where it's unconditional. Yeah. And uh, you know they you know follow me. I mean, all the lyrics that I write in the song, mm-hmm. I think when you when you read them now. Um, you know, they will have a, a, a broader meaning uh, mm-hmm. for you because um, you know what I'm talking about, you know. Man, I cannot wait to listen to that song with this fresh set of ears now. I, I, thank you. Thank you so much for telling me about that. Oh, you're quite welcome. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's about abuse, so I set the stage where um, I rescue a, an abused animal and, and, and uh, we share life together mm-hmm. and, that, and the animal is like, uh, we become kindred spirits. And at the end, we're um, in all that I am. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, it's hard for me to say the lyrics, and I'm not singing them. Um, all that you were. I, now, all that you were is now all that I am. Kindred spirits alone again. So, you know that is. You know the very the very end of it is sad, and it's it's the it's the transition period where you know we lose our animals. Yeah. So it, it's almost like. Um, kind of a whole life story condensed into a 12 minute song. Wow. I don't think that's ever been done in metal. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I'm not <laughs> aware of this topic ever been tackled in metal. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It, maybe it has been, but then I haven't heard anything like it, but yeah. Um, yeah. So that was like a really long answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am totally okay with that. Please, please don't apologize. <laughs> Okay, cool. Man, John, you know, I could talk to you for hours, but unfortunately, I have to go pick up my kid from school in a little bit. Um, that, but like, that's no problem. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go buy another bed right now. So, because Jim <laughs> is coming and he needs a place to sleep as well as the crew that comes here that are staying at my house. Oh. So we're we like we're getting ready for company uh tomorrow. They're gonna be here about three so we can start uh video shoot here. Oh cool. Uh, in in th- in this area and then we're gonna drive to New Jersey and do uh-huh. more of the narrative down there. And they're gonna hire a couple actors and actresses to actually act out some of the narrative, which is cool. So I don't have to put my face on camera because I hate doing that. <laughs> it's like, it's, I guess it's, it's part of the part of the uh, you know, what we need to do, but yeah. this time I'm Mm, geez. So, so you're you're still filming right now. So the video is probably going to be out in what two three days. Uh, no, not this <laughs> will be. Um, I, I believe they're going to release Wanderlust as a just a, a um, an audio file only. Mm-hmm. Um, coming coming up pretty soon, and then I think um, this video will be released on the tenth when the album is released. Oh wow! Day. Oh wow! But I think I think that's the plan. So, dude, wow! So you you guys have a lot to do in the next few weeks. It's, you know, it, it hasn't stopped. I've been, like, um, going just nonstop ever since we started writing this album. I forgot how much shit is involved with it. Mm-hmm. Stuff. But it, it's all good. It's all very positive. And it's great. It's for the fans to enjoy. And it's for, you know, the music lovers. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's weird. It's like, it, it's crazy. And then one day it just comes to a screeching halt. And and then you're pretty much caught up with all, everything they have to do, and then you know you kind of like sit back and watch the feedback and hope it's positive from the fans, mm-hmm. and um and that's where it, it hopefully it's rewarding where you can you can see that um you know, hopefully it, it's touched the fans in some way and that they like the album, and I can say that you know I'll, I'll be sixty coming up in, in May, um that I was able excuse me to accomplish, um you know doing this album. And a few other things, you know, and having it be successful, you know, all my fears of, you know, failure and falling on my face all the time, mm-hmm. you know, it's 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 unwarranted, um, and uh, it makes me feel good when the end result is um, well received by the fans because it, it doesn't get any better than that. And really, that's um, you know, that's a good percentage of why we do it. You know, um, we wanted to. Um, with Sympathetic Resonance, you know, there was so many fans that really liked the album, and there was a request, you know, everybody saying, come on, you got to do something else. So, you know, um, that was definitely a motivating factor for us to doing this album is, uh, you know, for the fans to give them something else. One quick question before I, get, uh, before I hit the road. Um, sure. Please, 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 please. Arch Matheos, U.S. tour, is it going to happen? 
Okay, so that is the golden question that everybody asks. And um, I am one person that hates to disappoint people. So I think you know where I'm going with this. But, mm. um, yeah, yeah, I know. But let me explain. Um, it's twofold. First of all, uh, Face Warning is going to go back in the studio, so that's a good thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, for another album. And um, I had made up my mind before we even started this album um, that there are personal things in my life that I need to tend to. I've actually been, it, it doesn't seem like it, but I've been going since actually uh, in the writing stages of Sympathetic Resonance. Um, you know, onto like, you know, and then the shows and then the DVDs and writing the DVDs and starting the writing for this album two years ago. So I've been really busy and I've neglected so many things in my life right now. So I've made mm -hmm. promises that I need to keep. Okay. Um, again, and I hate to mention again, I, I set my father coming down with the dementia also. Oh, no. I need to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm at the age where, you know, just shit starts falling apart. It's like, <laughs> that's the way it is. So, you know. Thank you. I appreciate you know what you're probably gonna say uh, you know um, about my dad, but if yeah. I need to, I need to be present right now in my life. So mm -hmm. um, and and I promised Jim that I would leave it closed ended because of the fact that you know he does get approached by a lot of promoters and people that you know want us to do um, you know festivals and dates and stuff right now. So mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be good on my all my promises. Just be present um, in my life right now. And what I'm going to do is what I've done before. I pretty much turn and walk away, go back to uh, regular life for a while, and see what happens. So. I don't know, man. There, for some reason, I suspect that you and I might meet again in Atlanta. You know, I, I have to leave it closed-ended, but um, I'm going to leave it at what I just said. <laughs> and I, and I, and basically, basically, I can't make any promises. Okay. Any promises, but but to, to be you know just brutally honest, right now there are no mm -hmm. plans for okay. that. Okay. So. Okay. Um, and it hurts. It hurts me to say that because I understand the live experience, and I am grateful for the fans a hundred percent. Hope they understand, and I hope that they really enjoy the music that's coming their way. Um, and 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 that, and I'll leave it at that. No, I, no, I think I can speak for everybody. Yeah, we understand. We get it. You know, you got to tend to things, uh, but we're also really, really grateful that you're putting music out again because we're we're loving it. We're loving it. Thank. You. Thank uh, you, and I thank you so much for your time and uh, for all the compliments and uh, about the music and the album and everything. So uh, that doesn't go unappreciated. I always awesome. appreciate the props. So thank awesome. you very much. Yeah, absolutely, John. It's been a blast talking to you. And there you have it. Nearly two hours with the one and only John Arch. The new Arch Matheos album is called Winter Ethereal, and it is out now on Metal Blade Records, and it is very, very good. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple, Google Play, and Stitcher, or the Podblaster of your choice if you want to get notified every time we drop a new interview or a new podcast episode. While you're at it, you can like, follow, and stalk us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can find all of our written, shot, and recorded goodies at sonicperspectives.com. This is Gonzo signing off, and from Winter Ethereal, this is Tethered, and no, that is not Willie Nelson in the video. Thank you.